This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Aloha Friday and Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii where community matters. We got a great show today. We're Skyping in a special guest from on the mainland, uh, on the East Coast, in fact. So she's up kind of late today to, to talk to us. But uh, I met our guest today when I was in California at the Fuel Cell Conference, and she made a great presentation. And uh, we're going to talk about her organization and uh, the things that her organization does to promote hydrogen worldwide. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mary Rose de Valderas. And, uh, Thanks for joining us today, Mary Rose. Good to have you on board. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. I'm always happy to talk about hydrogen and um, the International Energy Agency Hydrogen Technology Collaboration Program. Great. Well, why don't you start off by talking a little bit about yourself and how you kind of got into the energy business and, um, and then tell us a little bit about the uh, International Energy Agency. Right. Well, I was uh, originally trained as a, as an urban planner and um, and a linguist, and I actually did quite a bit of work in community development, both in Washington and out west on the, on the mainland, and uh, started a business actually with my late husband, where we built houses and we gradually started to build more renewable solar houses and passive solar houses. And, and then we also, then we began to do distributed energy systems because uh, the, of the great need for irrigation and the, um, the acceptance of the utilities of this kind of uh, technology application. Uh, so uh, that's how I got into it. And then I wound up working for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in their Washington office and um, uh, reset up my own business, MRS Enterprises. I worked for the World Bank around the world, and now um, I, I am the, have been general manager for IEA Hydrogen for some time. So that's the short story. Great. Yeah, I, I can appreciate um, the value there. We're in Hawaii. We're in a kind of unique situation where we have a high degree of intermittent renewable um, on our grid, and uh, it's becoming problematic for our grid to uh, absorb it all. So a lot of people are actually looking at putting batteries uh, with their solar on their houses and becoming more and more in, independent. They're still grid tied um, as an insurance thing, but a lot of people are getting really comfortable um, putting some energy storage at home and just going with uh, renewable energy and energy storage. Right, well, the world has changed a lot since, um, <laughs> since uh, renewable energy photovoltaics and wind first came along um, and the penetration has grown as you say to such a great extent now that it, it's really they're really considered um, mature technologies so uh, we recognize the IEA hydrogen recognizes very well that um, that storage and viewing hydrogen as part of an integrated energy system is really critical and um, so it's not just our wonderful potential fuel cell vehicles. It's it's actually the whole uh, energy system itself. The electricity and hydrogen are, are complementary energy carriers, and they work together. And uh, so hydrogen reserves can help to buffer the electricity system. And uh, certainly use of hydrogen for energy storage, whether short-term, seasonal, a long term uh, is, is is something that has great potential and the scale of it can vary vastly. I mean, it can be at the utility scale or it can be, as you just said, at the domestic scale or the co-op scale. So this is definitely uh, an idea whose, whose time has come. And, and uh, so we appreciate absolutely the need for storage. So what is, what is the International Energy Agency actually doing um, on the world stage in terms of promoting hydrogen and hydrogen energy storage and addressing those um, whole full ecology, energy ecology uh, uh, applications for hydrogen, not just the grid, but transportation and industry and uh, um, stabilization of the grid, um, storing curtailed power. What, what's the um, International Energy Agency doing in, on that front? Okay, uh, so let me take you back to um, how we got started. 
um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development was created after World War II to promote economic prosperity among its members. And then uh, this, this was finalized in, in, by 1960. But by the early 70s, there was, as we know, a gas crisis, also called an oil crisis. But in any event, it got the attention of the OECD because, in fact, they recognized that absent a uh, focus on energy, prosperity would be compromised. So the IEA was created, and it was created by treaty, like the OECD was. And uh, they, it was really sort of a brilliant concept because the IEA itself does policy work and analysis, and it also safeguards oil supply. But the same treaty that created the IEA also created technology collaboration programs. So any two members can get together and decide to do research and development in a particular area. So we were created to do our D and D in the in the hydrogen area, and we've been around since 1978 pursuing uh, our mission, which is to uh, to promote the application of hydrogen in all in every sector all around the world. Mm. So that's our background. We operate in five year cycles, so we have a strategic plan for for all five year for every five year cycle, and uh, we have three major themes. The most important one is R&D, because that's our, that's our basic mission, that's our core business. But we realized some 10, 12 years ago that despite all the good analysis work going on around the world in hydrogen and related topics in renewables, et cetera, uh, that, that there were still important questions that weren't being answered. And so we, we decided to also focus on analysis that positions hydrogen through technical analysis, market analysis, et cetera. As well, we have a third theme, hydrogen awareness, understanding, and acceptance, because it's really important to spread the news. I mean, this is this is a fairly complex subject. And going back to your initial question about where does storage tie in and how do this fit into the grid, well, part of our mission is to uh, make sure that people understand uh, more about hydrogen. So we're trying to make them aware of our, um, our various you know, research endeavors by, by publishing reports, final reports, interim reports on, uh, on all of our portfolio. Uh, we publish an annual report, we publish newsletters, and very recently we have uh, kicked off a new report called uh, um, Trends and Outlook for Hydrogen. This report, unlike some of our other, other reports, which are very technical in, in nature, this report seeks to reach decision makers and policy makers across the board. So it describes all the basics of hydrogen and what's going on now, what's trending now uh, in all the various applications around the world and among all the, um, the potential users and the members of our group. Because I failed to tell you who our group actually consists of. We have, we have 21 member countries uh, as well as the European Commission the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, that's a, a UN organization that deals with the developing world. And we also have, uh, those are our, our country members and our, our international organization. We also have sponsor members, not sponsors in the, in the traditional use of the business use of the term sponsors, but sponsors that are other kinds of organizations interested in participating with us in research on our mission. For example, Dell, uh, the National Organization of Wasserstoff and Brennstoffzellen. This is the German organization now. Um, HiSafe, a group dealing with hydrogen safety. And also Southern Company. That's America's very own Southern Company, a combined gas and uh, electric utility, um, which is you know has a very progressive vision of the future and wanting to be ready for it. So those are our members. And together, we create our portfolio of tasks. We operate in tasks uh, and respond to each of the themes that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. This sounds like you, you publish a lot of, of work and have it out in a broad range of uh, venues. Do you do anything that is a little bit more active in terms of um, things like this show, you know, outreach on media, um, social media, or National, uh, um, National Geographic Channel, or, or you know, Places where uh, Discovery Channel or BBC, where 
you get highlighted on a, on a, with a broader audience where you're really kind of addressing folks that are less technical but need to understand yeah. the technology. Um, what a great question, and what a, uh, we'd love to do that work. Right now, what we're doing the following. We're on Facebook, we're on social media, Twitter. Um, please follow us on Twitter. Um, but uh, we have yet to, um, to get a spot on National Geographic. So we'd love to do that work, absolutely. And in fact, in previous work that I've done for the United States Department of Energy, I have made videos and, and industrials, so we have the capability. We just don't have, we haven't had the opportunity yet, but we would certainly welcome it because you're absolutely right that that's the way to spread the message. Lots of people listen to TV that don't look at other things. True. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, Mary Rose, and we'll be back in 60 seconds and we'll pick up where we left off. Great. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch. And every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan Energy Man here with Mary Rose Ivelladeras from the International Energy Agency, and she runs the hydrogen part of that organization, getting the word on hydrogen out, which you know is my favorite topic. So welcome back, Mary Rose. And, Thank um, you. Did we, I, did we talk about the um, Hydrogen Council and what your organization does uh, with the Hydrogen Council? That's a fairly new organization, but also international and more based on um, industry partners. Yes. Um, well, the, the creation of the Hydrogen Council is really a benchmark for hydrogen world because uh, this, this entity uh, uh, comprises all of the major, many of the, most of the major players in hydrogen. And whoever's not there now, I'm sure will join in the future. And it really is critical that these entities, some of which are, um, some of, our, of these entities, they're, they're large corporate organizations, you know, uh, and they are dominant players in their various fields, including incumbent energy, companies. It's really critical that they step up to the plate. And we hope, we hope that they will join us uh, very shortly as a member. And we do plan to work with them. There are uh, lots of things that we can work on. And if you stay tuned, we'll have more information on that, hopefully in the next, in the coming months. Well, that'd be great. So you mentioned a five-year plan that um, your organization works off of. What's the current five-year plan covering for your research? Okay, well, the current five-year plan, uh, it covers the period uh, 2015 to 2020, and we are operating actually under each of the, each of the three thematic areas that, that I talked about. So uh, under our d and we work on production, hydrogen production. A great deal of our work has been in this area um, because it's, um, well, it's critical. And I'm happy to report that there's all kinds of uh, sources and feedstocks for hydrogen, and these can be found all over the world. And what you might not have in one place, you could trade for in another place. Then there's hydrogen storage. And as you already mentioned, this is a really critical topic, and it covers many aspects. There is, of course, the whole, uh, the whole realm of more basic fundamental uh, research and storage, because this is going to be an area that we're going to have to deal with in the future for lots of our applications. Uh, but but storage also includes uh, uh, things like um, uh, massive quantities of, of hydrogen underground storage in salt caverns and geological formations. And um, so this goes hand in hand actually with some of the production work because of uh, the um, high degree of renewable, uh, penetration that we now have mm -hmm. and, and I and I guess I can comment on that again later because that really is important because the two tie together 
We also deal with infrastructure issues, and these infrastructure issues are, are both at the system level, so for example, a car, you know, a, a, a heating system, and also in the broader infrastructure context. So those are the areas that we work on in our D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in analysis, we work on, uh, well, our, our most important analysis project right now is, is power to hydrogen and hydrogen to applications. So this, in fact, is, is the area where we talk about the conversion of um, electricity to uh, the conversion of hydrogen. Um, this is the area where we talk about power to hydrogen. And, and then it's storage, and then it's subsequent use for all kinds of applications. And, and this, this, this area really cross-cuts all, all sectors and all applications, has enormous potential for the future. And around the world, of course, people have been talking about power to gas for some, t for some time now. This is a very, very hot topic in, in Europe. But the topic, uh, but we are focusing on power to hydrogen. Hmm. And, and I know because I've talked to some folks from uh, Denmark that um, the North Sea wind projects are generating uh, Boku electricity and um, they need to store it and put it in those pipelines and move it around Europe. And, and I know that's one of the big projects that uh, you guys are watching. I think it's called a Leeds project. Can you tell us a little right. bit about that? Exactly. This is really a very, very exciting project. Uh, and it's exciting at many levels. Um, because, of course, one of the big objections to adoption of, of a new uh, technology or, or an, you know, a, a major new energy um, uh, source is, is cost. And this project, which was t uh, undertaken by the Northern Gas, um, Northern Gas Networks in the town of Leeds in the UK, uh, it, its, its purpose is to, is, is to actually first introduce hydrogen into the infrastructure, the gas grid there, as they call it, and, and hopefully, ultimately, to, um, to go entirely hydrogen. And uh, one of the really exciting uh, results of this study is that, is that this is actually going to be possible this, at, a, at a reasonable price. So uh, this is really a very exciting development because, of course, all over the world, there are, are gas works. And in the, in the recent past, as we know, the price of gas has, um, I, you know, the price of gas has been, become very attractive. And so gas has been for a long time viewed as a transition to hydrogen. And this project sort of encompasses all of the, many of the practical aspects of uh, how that process could work. And there's, there's different, different levels that, 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 that will be worked on um, from the, at the utility scale itself, the utility scale infrastructure in the UK, all the way down to the end user, you know, down the supply chain, and, and how this is going to work for, for one's toasters and electronic devices. But um, this project has enormous potential and cachet. And we, we, will hope, we are looking to launch some new work soon, and part of it will probably deal with some of the practical implications of this needs project. And we will, we will probably also co cooperate with um, our uh, sister technology, our sister T T TCPs in, in the fossil area, because they too are interested in, in the potential for gas conversion. So that little corner of the world is, is really going to be very active. So keep a close eye on it. I know okay. that you will. Yeah, we're um, out here in Hawaii, we're uh, working closely, my organization works closely with the US military and we actually have, um, if you know how the military works, they're very um, prudent on how they put things into their logistics pipeline. For example, they don't want 20 different kinds of fuel, they want two different kinds of fuel because they need to minimize the complexity of their logistics challenges. So right. one of the things that our US military does is they, they either use regular gasoline, diesel fuel or jet fuel and those things have to work in a broad range of vehicles. So for example, diesel fuel and jet fuel are almost interchangeable across Army and Air Force and Navy applications. So we have the Army out here this week from a an organization called TARDEC demonstrating a hydrogen fuel cell tactical vehicle. And mm -hmm. they actually have a 20-foot container 
that inside has a steam reformer that takes JP8, which is jet fuel, and turns right. it into hydrogen for that vehicle. And it's, it all fits inside a 20-foot container, and they can just bring it in the field, throw any kind of uh, JP8 or diesel in there, and it makes hydrogen for this vehicle. Then the vehicle can take off and, and get out hundreds of miles away from the base and generate power. It actually is a, a, a power takeoff unit, as we say, or a portable generator. And right. the military is looking at that very carefully right now. Yeah, we owe a lot to the military for the research that they've done. Um, so that's that'll be an exciting project to to watch. And, but this also reminds me that there's another area that we didn't talk about that's actually very exciting. IEA hydrogen has started to work in the maritime, and you know this is this this offers just tremendous potential because whether we're talking about the maritime and shipping and trade, or we're talking about the nexus between the between the land and the sea. Uh, there's a huge amount to be done there. So we have launched our first task in the maritime, and there is, is there is enormous global interest. I mean, the, the shipping industry is is huge. So uh, we're we are we, we we look forward to working in that area, and it, it just is offers all kinds of opportunity. And that is another area, of course, in which um, the um, uh, the military is also affected. In fact, of course, you know, uh, submarines were among the first to adopt uh, the fuel cells, to use fuel cells. Right. So, so there's just a lot going on in every major sector of the economy and um, and in the energy world and at all, all levels. Yeah, you and I talked earlier about innovation, and innovation isn't always brand spanking new technology. Sometimes it's old technology that you use in a new way. And one of the ways that we did that here was um, we had some Navy SEALs that were training and they told us that they had limitations on their lithium batteries on their equipment in terms of where they could go on certain ships and things like that. And I, I reminded them that fuel cells were actually, or excuse me, uh, electrolyzers were actually on nuclear submarines and other submarines to make oxygen for the crew and that their byproduct that they throw away was hydrogen and they could take that hydrogen and put it in metal hydride storage containers, which are like little little batteries. It's like two C-cell batteries on top of each other. And they work right. just like batteries in a, in a SATCOM radio or a regular radio or a GPS. And it may solve their problem of uh, getting a safe energy storage for that equipment where they can't normally get it on a ship. Because the Navy and the military in general, when they test equipment, they run it through a pre pretty rigorous cycle to make sure right. it doesn't in, impact negatively some other system. So uh, mm -hmm. they were surprised to learn that that technology was already on a lot of Navy ships and already certified to work on the Navy ships. So that was an exciting uh, revelation for them. I bet it was, I bet it was. So um, I guess we'll see more, more activity in that area very soon. I hope so. Hey, we're getting close to the end of time here. I wanted to turn it over to you for the end, but can you just kind of uh, I'm going to throw two questions at you. You can probably address both of them simultaneously. And, you know, is it just me or are we at a tipping point for hydrogen on the world stage? Are we at that point where hydrogen goes from being the fuel of the future and always will be to it's really happening right now and it's starting to get to scale and we're really seeing it? And to that matter, you know, how do we address the consortiums and the, and the lobbying organizations that are uh, arrayed against hydrogen, like the oil and gas industry, or even the battery industry in some cases, to um, to get hydrogen going in this uh, 2018 to 2020 time frame? Well, uh, I think the answer to that is that uh, you use all your tools. Um, I don't, I think there's probably, mm, there's probably going to be multiple inflection points but if you look at the example of California over the last 30 years, where they just dug in in the dirt and just continued to inch forward bit by bit, and, and there were plateaus that they reached where they were able to, uh, to really make great progress. And right now, certainly in California with um, the hydrogen refueling stations, they have made great progress there. So that's really an important step. But um, the other part of this is that uh, is that we is to build the understanding, you know, linking with all these other groups that it's it's not just 
the mass market of cars, which are critically important, but it's also all kinds of other other applications uh, that that will be um, that they can flourish through the use of hydrogen. And I, I also want to say that sometimes, you know, this is our government is a um, sometimes sometimes government can disappoint you. But I do want to say that. Uh, Back in our at our last omnibus energy bill in 2005 in this country, uh, there were provisions made in this bill for um, energy infrastructure and the process of laying the groundwork, the the basic land use plans for the infrastructure that will carry not just electricity transmission lines, but pipelines for hydrogen. Hydrogen is specifically included. That's all underway. So we're like, you know, 10 plus years, 10, 12 years out from that. Uh, but it's critical that all of the groups, I think, work together at some level. And certainly I can attest to the fact that there is growing interest in the IEA. And um, there will be probably even more interest very soon. And we can talk about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles maybe another time and the competitive landscape. Okay. Well, I agree with you. Um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach to getting the word out and making sure people understand that uh, the safety aspects of hydrogen are, are really strong and that the, the negatives like uh, Hindenburg type of analogies and uh, an H-bomb type of corollaries are, are just way out of line and that uh, we train firefighters in, in vehicle, responding to vehicles here vehicle incidents that have hydrogen vehicles. And by the time the, the firefighters finish the training, they're, they're like, this is better than gasoline or diesel. I mean, it's, right. we don't even have anything yeah, to hose salesman. down afterwards. Mm -hmm. We just let it go and it's in the air and it makes clouds and we pack up our stuff and go home. Um, and, and they're really actually pretty excited to learn about it, but we need to get that word out more. And, that, and that's kind of why I asked what, the, uh, what your agency was doing to really overtly get the message out and maybe try and be a little more aggressive. I, I said the same thing to the um, Hydrogen Council, that um, they really should look at a marketing uh, program that, that gets the word out, because I think that is critical. And it will take policy, it'll take government, it'll take right. industry, it'll take individuals. Um, mm -hmm. People underestimate the power of writing to your congressman or your congressional delegation. Um, mm -hmm. It's huge. And uh, yeah. supporting mm -hmm. the industry, I, even as a customer, just telling the gas company, hey, are you looking at hydrogen down the road for your fossil free um, fuel in the future? You know, there those you kind of things are, people don't realize they have a lot of power if they just get a pen to paper or, you know, send a message out. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, civic participation is important. Participation in the marketplace is important. And um, so we're gonna continue to work with with all of our uh, all of our members and hopefully our new members, and um, we're going to be working on analysis and uh, and outreach vigorously. All right, Mary Rose. Believe it or not, we've come smack up against the end of our 30 minutes uh, airtime here, and I want to thank you again for uh, visiting with us today and sharing your uh, thoughts. And uh, I know we've got more to talk about. Uh, we we still have to talk about vehicles and all kinds of things. But uh, I hope you'll join me back here on Stand Energy Man in the future, and we'll continue this discussion. But thank you again. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate everything that you do to make the hydrogen transition possible. Great. Well, aloha and aloha to our uh, viewers. Thanks to Robert in the control room and Cindy out here outside for helping keeping me in track. And uh, we'll see you next week on Stand Energy Man. We'll probably have a guest uh, host in there. I hope it's Rachel, maybe Dave. Um, I'm going to be off on vacation and taking a little bit of break, but we'll stand. Energy Man will be back on next week, and until then, aloha.